Hello everyone, I am back with Joy Marie, otherwise known as Savage Joy. She's an activist, she hosts her own podcast on Real Progressives, and she is here to kind of reflect what we all just went through and what we're going through currently. Joy, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me. These discussions are basically incredibly therapeutic to me and you know based on what the audience says they always love these because you know i think that it's okay if we admit that we don't always know the right words to say during tough times we don't always have the answers sometimes we don't have direction but if we just talk i think that that kind of goes a long way and we just need a good you know conversation right now um because we all have been going through a lot um, so I want to uh, just tease a little something. Uh, Joy has a pretty big announcement about a project that she's working on. We're not going to reveal that until the very end. So you have to watch the entire video. No fast forwarding. OK, um, so watch that. And, <laughs> and I'm not preggers. I, just as a as a heads up, I am not preggers. She maybe is <laughs> pregnant. No, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm too old. I'll be 41 in two weeks. I'm not even going there. <laughs> Well, happy birthday in advance. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to get your opinion because out of all the people I know who supports Bernie Sanders, nobody was more dedicated and invested than you. You literally like sacrificed five weeks of your life to go to Iowa and knock on doors for Bernie Sanders. And this is tough. Like you just mentioned before we went on that you got your ballot. I know my ballot is sitting in my mailbox. I haven't even checked yet because I I don't want to. Um, so let's just check in how are you doing um i'm i'm pretty heartbroken still um you know it's it's i would say it's 2016 all over again but it's not it's worse because it's like the second time um so there's kind of this ptsd of of sorts with this you know the death of democracy again um yeah, so I, I went to Iowa, I left my family, and I knew one person in the entire state. I had never been there, um, and I went for five weeks and, um, you know, knocked on hundreds of doors and ice and snow and, um, like, negative four degrees and, um, you know, just made thousands of phone calls. Um, and, I and you know, I was there caucus night and everything helping and I was so envious of everyone who was getting to vote, you know, um, caucus, but, you know, to vote. And I was like, I can't wait to get back to Pennsylvania and start, you know, being active there for our primary. Um, and I came back, they made me victory captain. And, you know, so I was going to be training people, things like that, um, on how to do phone banking and such. Unfortunately, uh, a connection I have in the campaign let me know the Sunday before uh, Bernie dropped that he was going to be dropping. And it was devastating um, because, you know, uh, I still had scheduled trainings the next three days. Um, and I am extremely dedicated and they were like, why can't you do it? You know? And I was like, I'm just not feeling like I can convince people to vote for him right now and stuff like that. And, and, you know, I still haven't watched, uh, the video where Bernie dropped. I can't like, I don't want to see it. All I know is he dropped. That's all I want to know. That's all I care about. Yeah, I don't I don't need to see him, um, you know, because I know it was hard for him. I know. But, uh, you know, it's as someone who has given, you know, so much to this campaign emotionally and physically and monetarily and and things like that, I absolutely feel a sense of betrayal. Um, did I expect him to take it to convention again? You're damn right. I did. Um you know, COVID fucked everything. I mean, let's keep it real. It fucked everything. And maybe he'd still be in the race if it wasn't for COVID, but he dropped too early. Now all the states are mail and ballot. So it's not like that's, you know, uh, putting people at risk necessarily because we can all vote by mail. Um, so he, he just dropped way too prematurely. Um, and 
and it's it's hurtful. And today I got my ballot, which I've been waiting for for over a year. Finally got it, and I had like a full on ugly cry when I you know <laughs> checked that box because I'm like here's, you know, it's all coming to fruition. Here it is. It's a culmination of everything I gave my life for, but it's not the same because he's not going to be president now. There's no hope of that. It's done. He's 78. He's not running again. It's done. Where the hell do we go from here? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I'm like a lot of people. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I genuinely don't know. I feel like a lot of anger. I feel in some ways energized, but also, you know, uh, demoralized. And I don't know where to take, you know, the 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 energy, the anger and place it next. Like all of this can't just dissipate into thin air like it has to go somewhere. We have to channel it. But right now, I don't think anybody really has a clear cut solution because movements, you know, I don't necessarily think that they hinge entirely on a leader, but it really helps to have a leader, to have a face. I mean, part of the reason why I truly believe Occupy wasn't successful is because it was a leaderless movement. There was no hierarchy and there are benefits to that. But at the same time, you know, if you don't have someone kind of guiding and steering the movement in a way, it really is difficult to maintain. So my number one goal is just to make sure that the whole crew stays together, like this energy for Medicare for all, and, you know, all these things that Bernie Sanders brought to the forefront, it's not going to just go away. So we have to make sure that the team stays together to continue fighting. But in terms of how we continue that fight, I genuinely don't know. And I, I agree with you. I was really, really, um, I was saddened when he dropped out. He did drop out too early. And in a way, I don't necessarily know if this is just because, you know, I still feel admittedly emotional because of all of this. I kind of resent Bernie in a way. Like, I don't hate Bernie, but I feel angry because it feels like we all poured so much into this, our hearts and souls, time, energy, resources, and I just feel like he didn't fight hard enough. And, you know, I, from the beginning, have been saying, you've got to be tougher, you've got to hit Joe Biden, and he never did. But at the same time, you know, I can rationalize his decision to not hit Joe Biden because his his strategy was working. He was leading in the polls, right? So it wasn't necessarily something that I thought was sinking his campaign until after Super Tuesday. That was a different race. And at that point in time, Bernie needed to really look in the mirror and ask himself if he truly wants to win. And I never thought that he did that. He changed nothing. And he just ran the same campaign, which we all knew wasn't going to be successful. So to me, I feel hurt because it seems like he just kind of surrendered. Like he put up the white flag and... Like, I get it, right? Like, I can't expect someone who's 78 years old to sacrifice their time and energy if he doesn't really feel like it's going nowhere. But at the same time, you know, I, I still like we all kind of we put everything into that campaign, our hopes and dreams. And this isn't like here's the thing. And like, there's a lot of people who love that the Bernie bros are all demoralized and whatnot. But this isn't like a sports team losing to us. Like, to me, this was so important that I felt like if Bernie wasn't elected, humanity doesn't have a chance. And what I mean by that is if Bernie got elected, he was the only person who I believed would actually fight to get action when it comes to climate change and lead the world. And I wasn't even, you know, um, under this illusion that he would be successful. I just felt like he would give us a chance, right? He wasn't a savior. He's a human being who was very influential, but not perfect. Um, and now that he's gone, I just I don't know what to what to think of this. Right. Like, who's next? What can we do um, there? And, and the answer is there's there's no one. No one's ready to step up. Nobody has the credibility or name recognition to step up. Nobody is as bold as Bernie Sanders. And it's not like Bernie was this god who was infallible. He was very flawed as a candidate. He made a lot of mistakes that I feel uh, frustrated by. But in terms of like anyone who's near his level there's no one so i'm kind of feel like you know we're all just flailing we don't we don't know what to do we don't know where to go we don't know how to make what has been created a sustained movement and it's a little bit disheartening and in a way i feel like maybe after covid19 is you know when we could put that behind us maybe things will become a little bit more clear because i kind of feel like myself and others just have tunnel vision we just want to get through this right now um, but it's tough. And I, I think that the lack of direction, it is, it's hard. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on some of the re revelations that we have at kind of 
added to my anger with Bernie Sanders. I shouldn't say anger. Like, I don't know if I'm angry at him. I just like, I'm giving him the cold shoulder, you know, if I were speaking to him currently. Um, we yeah, learned... he and I are, are separated right now. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're not divorced, but we're separated. <laughs> we need couples therapy, like 100%. Um, yes, yes. Well, we learned about Jeff Weaver starting a super PAC and how everyone within the campaign, they knew about Jeff Weaver. Now, I was an outsider. I didn't know about Jeff Weaver. And, you know, some of the signs that we saw back in 2016 or 2017 with the revolt of the Our Revolution staffers. What do you make of this? Because to me... I thought Bernie knew better than to surround himself with people like Jeff Weaver. Can you just kind of share your thoughts? Because this really, it pissed me off. Yeah, I mean, the the thing is, you know, being so connected to the campaign, I will be totally transparent. I did know that Weaver, Baz, and um, Chuck Rocha were very not well-liked, to put it that way. Um I, I met Jeff Weaver and I actually interviewed him um, a year ago, um, or 18 it was, um, and he's quite charming. Um, he was very nice and personable and um, encouraging and, and it came across very, very genuine. Um, now, the thing about Bernie, which I've heard from his own family members, is he is loyal to a fault. You're friends with him. You're nice to him. My friend Joe, you know, that is Bernie. When he puts his hand on Liz Warren's back, I want to grab his shoulders and shake him. <laughs> but to him, she he's still loyal to her, even though she's garbage to him. And that's how he was with Jeff Weaver. They've he, Jeff has worked for him for 32 years. So that at that point, it becomes like, a family member you know and and you know i mean that's the only uh job jeff has known has been working for bernie and i think bernie had that sense of obligation in a way um but since you know faz took jeff's place a lot of us were like okay good someone new's getting in there and then we started learning how the campaign staff was calling him Spaz um, as as his nickname. And uh, Chuck Rocha, I was told, was, you know, very shady, but he seems so nice and, and intelligent and for the movement. And, you know, the thing is, I wanted to say, you know, a number of things I, you know, was told by higher ups on the campaign, but it would have hurt Bernie. Yeah. So, you know, someone from WAPO sees my show and says, ooh, Bernie's campaign, you know, manager is like conspiring against him. And next thing you know, I fucking screw Bernie, you know, out of votes. So I didn't want to go there, but I was apprehensive and it was um, a frustration by a lot of people on the campaign. Um yeah, so it's it's difficult. I am not surprised in the least that they created this pack. Nobody is. No one. That's interesting. Even Bernie. That's so interesting. And, you know, like you said, he's loyal to a fault. And I think that that's admirable, but it's not admirable when it reaches a point where it's literally harmful. You know, it, it goes back to the Joe Biden is my friend thing. You can't say that. Like, this is not a good person. This is someone who has voted for a war that has killed hundreds of thousands, if not more than a million Iraqis. This isn't a good person. And that's not to say that Bernie is perfect or would be a perfect president. But, you know, to me, it's just a blind spot. And I kind of viewed it as naivete on Bernie's part because you can see the good in people. I think that that's, that's great. You know, I, I love optimism. I At my core, I think I'm a pretty optimistic person. But at some point, you know, that instinct, that mechanism that, you know, tells you to kind of be skeptical, it's got to kick in. And I feel like it never kicked in for Bernie Sanders. Um, and we, you know, we just saw, what was it last week? He did a live stream with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, how can you, do, she just, right? She just said that your campaign was built on a foundation of hate. I'm paraphrasing, but like attacking yeah. all of Bernie Sanders supporters. Like to me, that is unforgivable. Like, 
you know what this movement is about. I don't like I personally Bernie's just a vessel. I want policies. Give me policies and I'll shut up and go away. Give me Medicare for all and the wars. These are like very simple things that we want. So to say that that's motivated by a foundation of hate, he should have called her out publicly for this. Some things are just beyond the pale and what she did to try to sink him. That's not what friends do. That's not what friends do, you know, if you're genuinely a friend. Like, the way that Joe Biden treated him, uh, Joe Biden's characters are finding out about the sexual assault allegations. At some point, you've got to reevaluate who you're friends with and realize if they're kind of bringing you down. And I just feel like Bernie never did that. And I don't want people to think... I'm against Bernie and I'm just dogging on Bernie, but I do think that if we want to be successful at anything going forward, we have to be introspective and we have to ask these tough questions because Bernie is not a cult leader. And I think that the mainstream media is surprised how, you know, we are able to criticize him so easily after they called us a cult for two years or four years. Um, but I mean, I want to be successful and I want the policies that I advocate for to be codified into law one day. So we have to kind of look ourselves in the mirror and ask where did we go wrong? Um, and this is kind of what I wanted to pick your brain about, because I think that there's a lot of things that Bernie could have done better. But at the same time, I think that there are also things that are kind of outside of our control. I don't think there's anything that he could have done to rein in the media bias. He could have maybe called it out more. I don't know that that would have helped. But just within the realm of things that we can control, what do you think, if you were advising Bernie you would have told him to do and just in your opinion this is loaded you might not have an answer what do you think is the number one thing that led to his demise um i kind of have a theory but i want to hear what you have to say so we can compare notes um two things i think uh which led to us losing votes are a joe biden's my friend and b yes i believe he can win against trump yeah never say that about your opponent first of all it's not true he can't win against Trump. We all know this. Biden's going to lose. If they don't, you know, if they keep him in there, he will lose. We will have Trump again. That's a fact. So the fact that Bernie was like, yes, I can, you know, and he kept saying it. No, Bernie, shut up. Say, I believe I'm the only one who can win. Because then he would say, um, you know, I don't think status quo can win against Trump. I don't think big money can win against Trump. Yeah, I believe Joe can beat him. No, dude, he can't. So I think, you know, when people are watching this and they're undecided, yeah, even Bernie said Joe can beat Trump. No, he can't. So I think he played it way too soft. I mean, in 2016, we were like, go harder on Hillary. She's garbage, you know, but he went harder on her than he did on Joe. Yeah. I mean, the, the one... um. Uh, debate when he was like, I'm going to ask you a third time. Did you say you'd cut Social Security? I was like, yes, finally, let's go, Bernie. Yes, yes, yes. And then it was one night only. He stopped. It was like, no, I finally thought you were going to like go hard. Like it was, I don't know, you know, what was said or what was done. I don't know. All I know is I keep thinking back to um, in 2018, when I um, interviewed um, Jeff Weaver, and he had just come out with his book, and he was telling me about how, and I do believe him on this, I really do, um, because we had a lengthy discussion about how psychologically and mentally it affected Bernie so much when Trump won, because he did partially feel responsible. I mean, he was in a place nobody else in the world was in. And he's in that place, he's in that place again. He's being held to make all of his bros fall in line, which we're not going to, but he's being held to that expectation. Um, and we cannot truly fathom what that's like for him. And that's not to rationalize or make excuses. That is just literally um, the case. He does feel a very big sense of responsibility to get Trump out of office um, because he knows he's being blamed for him being in it in the first place. And when countless people say that, it kind of fucks with your head and you're like, maybe I did kind of help. We all knew he didn't. Um, 
but I, I get it. He has that, that sense of responsibility that none of us can comprehend. Um, as, as far as, you know, complaining about the media and stuff, that to me is kind of hopeless just because when Trump does it, people flip out. Oh, there's like a Nazi, you're saying, you know, the media is awful and, um, you know, and, and Bernie came out with an article that said he thinks the media is one of the reasons he lost and it just was not good. Um, so I think really just the main things were, well, and also, uh, you know, he, he, um, he took on Iowa for the in inconsistencies. What about Massachusetts? What about Texas? What about you winning California and not getting delegates for over a month? Why aren't you saying these things? Like us as volunteers worked for these votes. We worked for these delegates. We deserve them. So the fact that you're not saying, you know, as a campaign, we have every right to say, you know what? Our exit polls show not only did we win, we won by far, and now we're coming in like third, you know what I mean? It just, it wasn't making sense. Um, so yes, we could have taken, uh, taken on um, individual states more as well. I feel like after Iowa, he wouldn't have been unreasonable to request an audit of every single primary after that. I mean, that's something that was unprecedented. We've never seen anything like that. And I don't necessarily know that there's anything there with the exit polls. Um, I know that they oversample younger people. But at the same time, when we saw what happened with Iowa, like I was already calling for, you know, some type of international organization to oversee our elections because you can, like you can't. Here's the thing. Regardless of the outcome, you can't have people lose faith in the process. And one thing that's become abundantly clear is that nobody trusts the process. You can't have a democracy if people don't trust the process because then, you know, they don't actually feel like their votes mean anything. And when people check out of democracy, democracy dies. And I'm not saying that to be hyperbolic. I'm saying, like, comparatively speaking, in these types of countries, mostly younger democracies, when people check out and stop voting, they end up dying or they slide into illiberalism or authoritarianism. So, I mean, the people who claim to care about democracy, they're not taking this seriously. You know, um, even just the fact that we have 100 million people that don't vote, that is a huge, huge red flag. It doesn't bode well for, you know, the long term strength of our democracy and nobody's taking it seriously. So, um, yeah, I, you know, one thing to me and I'm I'm not 100 percent sure that this is like the smoking gun, the one thing that led to Bernie losing. And I think that he could have made some um, adjustments afterwards. But I think that after South Carolina, Obama getting everyone to kind of coalesce around Joe Biden, that really did have a substantial effect. And I, I can't remember who conducted the study, but they showed like the differences between the left and centrist is that they really respect party figures, Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, like these people, they say something and it's like gospel, whereas the left obviously isn't like that. You know, we're like, fuck the authority. Um, so when Obama got everyone to coalesce, like when everyone kind of dropped out behind the scenes, we all knew it was Obama and endorsed, you know, Joe Biden. That was huge. It changed the entire dynamic of the race. And I think that largely that is one of the biggest things that led to Bernie's loss. I, I can't say like it's too soon to say that's definitely what did it. But it was one of the factors oh, no, unquestionably. Yeah, if they if those all those people stayed in vote would have kept being split. I mean, that is absolutely the number one reason mathematically 100 percent. It's um, it's as soon as they dropped out, that's when, OK, you have two candidates. That's it. You know, before you had six. Well, they go different ways. Well, now you have two. And unfortunately, Biden voters, their second choice was Bernie. I never believed that until I was at a caucus site in Iowa and Joe Biden was not viable in my location. And the majority of them came to me That's in crazy. my section, which was insane. I'm like, they're so different. Yeah, they're both like old white dudes, but like they couldn't be more different. Um, yeah, it was crazy. So being given, you know, people have Obama nostalgia. That's mm -hmm. what it comes down to. They want Obama number three. Oh, we miss him so much. Oh my God, handsome, well-spoken. And they ignore, you know, all the horrible things he's done. 
Um, and Joe is just kind of like an extension of going back to normal, which anyone with a brain knows that uh, for people of color and, and, you know, women and LGBTQ, like going back to normal is not good. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of it is privilege, a lot of it. Like, I don't care about, you know, policy. Joe Biden has no policy. Right. What does he stand for? I don't fucking know. I have That's no idea. No phone bankers. What are you going to do? Call someone and then they're like, what do you say about how's he feel about health care? I mean, he doesn't like Medicare for all like that. No, all what does he support? <laughs> how do you, and also, how do you phone bank and answer like, what about Tara Reid? What about the Iraq war? Like how that's why nobody I want them to call me so bad, <laughs> like so bad. I'm like, please call me because um, I I would probably uh, make them cry. But um, <laughs> <laughs> it would kind of be worth it um it would, yeah, it would. I, I think we're we're pretty fucked uh to be honest but not that i support them just doing a switcheroo and putting in like an idiot like cuomo who hasn't done a single event or gotten a, a single you know uh delegate because that is also the epitome of undemocratic uh, but joey himself even said the VP I pick needs to be ready to step up immediately. Why? It's like he knows they're going to pull the 25th Amendment on him. And mm -hmm. he's sending Jill out for him, things like that. It's. I think he knows. I, I really do. I think he knows, like, he cannot, you know, cognitively deal with anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, my feelings are kind of all over the place on that because it's like to my core, I have to be consistent. And if Joe Biden got more votes, all right, you know, no matter how he got those votes, he gets to be the nominee. That's just fair is fair. Right. I mean, I was I was very angry when we were leading and there was all this talk of Bernie Sanders having it stolen away from him at the convention with super delegates. Liz Warren even said that she would be open to this. Right. Um, so I, I think that if you get the most votes, that's fine. That being said, I'm not going to shed a tear for Joe Biden if there is a switcheroo that happens at the convention. I don't think that will happen. I'm not going to shed a tear for him because he was advocating the same thing. I mean, I keep pointing to an article on my show about how Joe Biden says that if somebody gets a plurality, Bernie Sanders, but not a majority, he will uh, aggressively compete for the nomination at the convention, which means he was willing to resort to a contested convention. So, I mean, you're the one who asked for this. You said that, you know, contested convention is A-OK -okay if it's to stop Bernie. So now you reap what you sow. You're kind of a horrible candidate, you know. And there's the Tara Reid allegation. Sorry, I believe her. Anyone who doesn't is, I think, fooling themselves. Um, and it's just, like you said, we're fucked. <laughs> I don't think that you can put it more simply. And it's it's so, so frustrating. And it's got to be like a slap in the face to activists, especially yourself, how Joe Biden won states he didn't set foot in when Bernie supporters were relentless, phone banking every fucking minute that they had to spare. And this asshole won by doing nothing by standing for nothing. Like, I'm reminded of this video, I think it was after Iowa, where some of his volunteers took turns sharing, like, 50 things that they liked about Joe Biden, or 30 things. Yes! And none of them had policies. I, I saw, like, two policies, maybe, and it was like, oh, he's nice. He's committed. It's like, none of this means anything. Joe Biden says there's nothing that we can't accomplish together, but then he says we can never have Medicare for all. Like, this man, he doesn't stand for anything. It's so irritating to me. So it feels like, you know, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. Like, I know Democrats like to pretend Trump is uniquely terrible. And sure, maybe he is with regard to tone. But, you know, Democrats, their reign broke during the Bush years as well. And rightfully so. That was a much more destructive presidency. But Donald Trump, like in 10 years, they're going to normalize him when we get President Tom Cotton or someone who's even worse. And I think that this fear mongering has not been good for the left. It, it hasn't been good for the center. Because here's the thing, like Joe Biden 
is, I think, better than Donald Trump, albeit marginally. But if we are able to defeat Donald Trump, all of the bad policies that come along with Trumpism aren't just going to vanish into thin air. Sure, we, we don't have war with Iran if Joe Biden is president, most likely. But that doesn't mean it's done forever. We postpone it four to eight years until a Republican gets involved. Maybe the best case scenario, you know, Joe Biden gets to appoint someone to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm not convinced she'd step down if a Democrat was... Uh, able to win the presidency. So it's like we're we're seeing the line between Democrats and Republicans become blurred. And this Tara Reid situation makes matters worse because the one kind of like pull that Democrats had was that they were just better on social issues, women's issues, LGBTQ plus issues, you know, racial justice. And now they're proving that they literally stand for absolutely nothing. So what are we supposed to do? Like, we don't have real choices in this country. And I don't like the talk of just getting a third party like we need fundamental for reform we need five to six parties like we have a lot of ideological diversity in this country even if i'll say voters aren't the most ideological but we need to be able to have like an honest discussion policy wise about what we need to do to fix our country and we're not going to get that with the same two-party duopoly that's been taking place so it you know for me i'm just kind of like reassessing what is going to work? And I think that one of the conclusions that I've come to is that electoral politics is kind of a dead end. I'm not saying that we check out of electoral politics. I think local and state politics is really important, electorally speaking, and we should absolutely support candidates running for Congress. But in terms of just like only eyeing the presidency, I don't think that that's going to make us successful in the long run. I mean, it was nice because we're, we're this close. We're this close to getting the most powerful office in the land, but it didn't work. And nobody else is going to be able to fill that void that Bernie Sanders is leaving. So I, I think the biggest question is, what's next? And there's no answer to that. I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, not to be, you know, a downer to the viewers or anything, but, you know, this one dude, he's the one that planted the seed for everything. So, no, and he is far from a deity and he is far from, you know, a god or infallible. But the fact of the matter is, he did plant the seed that brought things like free college, Medicare for all, Green New Deal to the main stage. Nobody this, uh, you know, election year would be talking about any of that shit had Bernie not run in 2016. He also mobilized over a million volunteers. You know, the the uh what he has inspired in a movement to at least create that groundwork. If we can't do it, I don't fucking know who can. I don't fucking know. Unless someone comes out that none of us have ever heard of, I don't know who else has a 40-year history of activism. I don't know who else has, you know, been fighting for the people that long. Um, I, I feel like if we can't do it with him on the ballot, I, I just kind of don't have hope in that regard at all. It's it's so hard to have hope, right? I mean, I mean, I kind of like, I'll go back and forth. Like, sometimes I'll feel genuinely hopeful and optimistic, but then other times I'll feel like that was stupid, that optimism was pointless, like it's, nothing is going to amount to anything. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, one thing that we have going for us, and I use the word going for us, you know, loosely because it's not a good thing, is that um, all of the material conditions that existed that you know are plaguing the working class they existed before we really knew about bernie sanders as a country and they're going to continue to be an issue going forward so so long as these issues are there there is going to be a type of um i don't know there's going to be an opportunity and it's just a matter of how a movement or a person seizes on that opportunity and the problem is that it's not necessarily like good actors that can use that opportunity. We see, you know, rising fascism around the world. It's not just in the United States with Donald Trump. You know, he seized on that. He seized on the material conditions in the United States. So it's just a matter of like, who's going to get to it first? Um, and it's a question that I don't know. Like it's, we don't know the end of the story. Not that this story really has an end, but we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Is it going to get better or just progressively worse and we become acclimated to the shit situation? And I think that all of this uncertainty is what's driving a lot of like the depression and the demoralization because it is tough. Like you want some sense of 
what the future is going to be. And you can have a loose sense, right? None of us know what's in store for us. Things can change on a dime like that. But, you know, if you can kind of anticipate, all right, well, there's a general way that the wind is blowing. You know, we're, we have Bernie Sanders and, you know, we're inching towards progressivism. You know, the younger generation, you know, anyone who's under 45, basically, is very progressive. So that's what we have in store for us. I think that that's something to hang on to, possibly. But then I also tell myself, conditions can change. Um, you know, it, I don't think it's as easy as some people are saying that we just wait for the boomers to die. Not that, you know, we love boomers. There's a lot of great boomers in the Bernie movement. But it's not so easy as waiting for the next generation to die off because people's opinions change over time. And someone who supports Bernie today, 10 years from now, could be, uh, you know, duped by some different ideology. You know, people aren't as consistent and principled as we as I would have liked to thought uh, to have thought they were. And this election is definitely showing that with the Tara Reid stuff. I mean, I believe Democrats when they came out against Brett Kavanaugh swinging, you know, with because I believe Christine Blasey Ford. And I thought, well, you know, it's great that we at least have allies in power who are looking out for women, at least, you know, rhetorically, at least when it comes to, you know, these issues. And now it's mask off for everyone. Nobody cares. Everyone just wants power. And I don't know how to process that. And I think a lot of people don't know how to process that. And I don't know what to do with that information. I don't know how to work within the confines of that very disgusting system. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to is, you know, I protested at Occupy DNC at the convention in 2016, six days marching like eight miles a day and over a hundred degrees. I mean, it was insane. Um, but I couldn't have gone through that week were it not for my brothers and sisters with me. Um, so I will be doing that again. I already have my, my place booked in Milwaukee, so I'll be flying out from Pennsylvania. Um, it is, according to Tom Perez, not that I trust him, but he said in his squeaky, annoying voice that it's still going on. He said that a few days ago. Um, so if it's still going on, I am there, I am in the streets, I'll be filming. If it does go, uh, become virtual and it's canceled, I am organizing with one other person, a protest in DC at the DNC headquarters. Either way, they're going to fucking hear me. Like yeah. either way, I will be there and I will have other comrades, whoever wants to come. Um, they're going to listen, period. Um, what will it do? I don't know, but it fucking felt good when I did it before. I mean, at least uh, selfishly, I don't know, but at least it felt good. Like it felt like I'm, you know, saying like, fuck you, like, um, you know, and, and look at the dem exit numbers. Like you did this yourself. Tough shit. Yeah, they're hemorrhaging support, and that will continue. And maybe, you know, Joe Biden can squeak by and win, but that's not going to change the underlying issues with the Democratic Party. And I will say one good thing that we can take away from this election, um, and just Bernie Sanders, that phenomenon in general, even if it's over, I think, and this is corny, one of the greatest gifts that he gave us was each other. We, like, we've made so many great friends, you know, throughout this process. Um, you know, there's so many people that I know personally, like my mom, who was awakened politically for the first time. Um, and this is this is so special like that there's real value in that so it's not like all of this was done for nothing i don't want people to take that away all of the effort that we did make to get bernie elected we don't know how that's going to pay off but even if you know in your life you just convinced one extra person that is huge that is huge because it takes all of us at an individual level to you know have an effect on the on the macro level you know um so that's what I will say. Um, is there anything before we get to your special announcement that you wanted to talk about? Because we could basically talk for days and um, not run out of things to say. But is there anything that you kind of had that you wanted to bring up on cam? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I have a lot of great shows coming up. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think we we talked on much of it. I you know, when I post these things about Bernie people, some people get very defensive and, yeah. you know, I have to, I have to clarify a lot. Look, I love him. I will always love him, but he's pissing me off. Like yeah. it's that simple. Um, and I took, uh, the Bernie poster down that I've had every show for three years. 
um, because I, I just, I, I don't, maybe it'll go back up one day. I don't know, but you know, my audience was kind of upset, you know, that I did. And I'm like, look, I, I'm going through grieving period here. <laughs> like I, when I look at that, I see pain right now. Yeah. I don't need to look at it. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people are grieving a different way. Um, I'm glad I got to vote today, but it's still kind of, you know, sore. Um, but, and I think we're all dealing with that, you know, despair and depression and hopelessness um, in our own way. And I'm just looking forward to being an activist again, because you can't be one right now. Unfortunately, like armchair activism is not my thing. I want to get back out like on the Capitol steps and stuff like that. Um, so the, the forced agoraphobia is not really my thing. I'm looking forward to just, you know, getting back out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get that. Um, and as someone with actual agoraphobia, like I literally have agoraphobia, um, this is even too much for me, right? Because <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. Aww. I have agoraphobia. I've made some progress over the course of the last um couple of years, but I mean with anything you kind of backslide. Um, but you know, this is even like a bit much to me because there is like a greater sense of like being confined. And even though that that's comforting to me in a way, it's still really uneasy, right? Because if I want to go, um, you know, get a bean and cheese burrito from Taco Bell, um, I don't want to have to like get on the mask, get hand sanitizer. Like it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot. And th that's like totally a first world problem, right? I could be way worse off, but you know, it's, it is a scary time in general. You know, my best friend, she has COVID. You know, she's a healthcare worker. My niece is in healthcare and I'm terribly worried about her. So I just want everyone to be able to move past COVID. And I think that once we do get past this and we will get past this, I think then we can kind of figure out what to do next. And I will say to people who are feeling depressed because it's certainly not just us, you know, there's nothing that we can say that is going to make you feel better. But hopefully it's comforting to know that you're not experiencing this alone. There's a lot of people online who need people to talk to, who, you know, will text with you and call with you. Um, and even if that doesn't necessarily seem like it's something you want, trust me, it does really help. Just talking to someone about things, it's important. Like, see, one of the things that irritates me is, you know, whenever these types of issues pop up and we discuss mental health nationally, you know, as a country, it's always, oh, seek help, get a therapist. A lot of people don't have money for that or insurance. Um, so we have to make do with what, we, uh, what we've got. And, you know, talking to people with the same types of issues who are going through the same thing, a lot of us are experiencing this right now. Um, it really does help. So I will, uh, I will leave people with that. Um, we don't want any, anyone to come away, you know, feeling like there's no hope. It feels like that now, but there have been times where we felt like this before and we felt hopeful again, like the world keeps turning, you know, the sun will rise again. But right now it's all darkness. Um, and it sucks. It seems like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But I genuinely believe, as I said to my core, I am an optimist. I believe things will get better. Um, and that's deep within. Like You have to like really dig to find that belief in me. But I know it's there. I know it's there. And I know that things will get better. It's not going to be perfect. We're not going to live in a utopia. But, you know, uh, better than now. Um, because how could it possibly, you know... Um, well, I shouldn't say how could it get worse. Um, but yeah, no. I think things are good. <laughs> I'm not going to jinx it. <laughs> Knock on wood. But <laughs> I think, you know, the thing is, like, I, I, you know, I get so down sometimes. And then I think, you know, it's kind of trite. But like, at the end of the day, I do not want Nira Tandon and Alyssa Milano giving each other cheers with mimosas that I'm crying in the corner. <laughs> so fuck that. Like, they're not going to see me like continually like down. Because yes. That's what they want. And it's trite, but it's freaking true. They relish in us being sad. Oh, Bernie draw. They don't get it. It's it's not, you know, in their conceptually, they're just too immature. But um, so fuck it, you know? Yeah. We'll be down and out. We're allowed to be down but get back up exactly if anything be more annoying be a bigger thorn in the sides of the establishment give these fuckers hell because they've given it to us and yeah I, I think that's such a great thing to point out like don't be down because that's exactly what they want and they've won but i mean 
the fact that we almost won is kind of astonishing because this is like a grassroots movement and we took on a capitalist machine like a global capitalist leader like that's kind of fucking insane if you think about what we went up against and we almost won right we didn't but it's still remarkable um so there is a there there we just gotta harness it and uh try to move on um so i will say that you have a very special announcement um about the next project that you're working on i got spoilers and i love it i'm so excited take it away joy i had to tell someone like i'm anyone who watches my show knows like i don't keep things and i don't really but so when people come to me and they're like yo breaking but you can't tell anyone i'm like ah. uh, so I'm yeah like, <laughs> so i've been working on this for like almost a month and i'm like gonna explode but um so myself and Peter Douche slash Nate Sliver slash Pat the Burner, Pat Coat, um, all one person, uh, and I are writing his next, um, our next parody, um, which is on the resistance um, trademark. So <laughs> it's all about Karenisms and, you know, just the hypocrisy and we hate Bernie bros. Um, and all of those things. And we are just having so much fun writing it. Um, we have given ourselves a due date of June 30th. Um, and we will be doing pre-orders sometime around there. Um, and w the reason we're trying to write it so quickly, well, first of all, the, you know, the resistors on Twitter are kind of helping us write it themselves, to be quite honest. Yep. Um, but the reason we <laughs> we set that date um, for next month is because we hope to have them edited and printed by the time we go to convention so we can, you know, sign them for people and, and stuff there. Um, Pat's last book, the Peter Douche book, um, was a huge success. So, um, one day I was like, I'm so fucking depressed. Write a book with me. And he's like, really? I was like, yes. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I was like, yay. So um, we've just been having a blast with it. And and I'm so happy that I finally got to uh, say something because I haven't even told my organization that my show is on. Like literally really? nobody knows except my husband and you and Peter Douche. <laughs> like, that's, that's incredible. Um, <laughs> but I will say that um, all of our favorite characters are going to be in it. All of our favorite shit libs um, make at least a small appearance. Um, and uh, and all I'll say is um, some of our favorite burners will make an appearance too. Nice. So it's, it's geared to make people laugh and it's actually making us laugh while we're writing it. So... I think it'll be kind of cathartic for people to be like, oh my God, I saw people say that. It's so hilarious. Like, and just kind of, you know, if we don't laugh, we'll cry. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm excited for people to read it. I think it'll be really great. I am so excited. Um, and like, I got a little bit of, you know, uh, background information about some of the shit lib characters. You guys are going to die laughing. Um, and just the fact that you mentioned the Karenisms will be included in the book. Uh, I, I feel like we need this right now, so <laughs> I'm yeah, looking it, forward it, to it. What gave me the idea is is watching the disgusting responses from women about Tari. I was like, I I can't even. I gotta like do something like poetically or or something like this to to just let me escape from this because I'm. It is so egregious. And then I was like, let's just take you know make Alyssa milano and and such is already a parody essentially <laughs> so you know let's just do something with that and then also you know last year i lost over 70 percent of my eyesight so oh. this is a you know and I, and I was an english major so this is you know i haven't been able to really write so this has been very um very good for me that's um, so awesome kind of, so that I can I can still do what I love to do. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. And it's not just like helping you. Like this is something that I think a lot of people are going to love. Like we need to laugh. Like you said, like if we don't laugh, then we're gonna cry. So we need to laugh. Um I just I okay, I gotta press you a little bit. Um and you don't have to say this because I don't want to spoil it, but Alyssa Milano's character, can we get any background 
on uh, on that any name for her i'm not gonna give her name but um let's just say uh we are kind of going through tweets to kind of <laughs> you know i mean there's no way you're not gonna know who these characters are yeah yeah let's just put it that way like you're if you're on twitter you know who these people are oh yeah period there's gonna be no discussion yeah <laughs> it... just hoping we don't get sued because <laughs> 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 i'm like what is the legality of this because uh fair use fair use you know, i've had to be very very like um uh, I had to do a lot of research about fair use, and that is that's all parody. That's fair game, so they can't touch you. And if they try, uh, they're in the wrong. Um, but it, yeah, it, I mean, we're only saying what they said. So if they find it offensive, they need to be self-critical because we're just literally saying what they themselves said. Yeah, stop being so, such a self-parody if you don't want to be in a literal parody book. Like maybe maybe yeah. that you know. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it they don't turn around and write one about me they'll be like she talks like a valley girl and you know <laughs> all the shit will come out i'm like but you know fair game i guess uh, hey they're not they're not artistic enough to do something like that these are shills these are corporate ghouls they don't care so we've got to make fun of them because that's all we got that's the that's the best that we can do to make ourselves feel better and anyone who is like very online on twitter i already know that they're gonna love this based on what you've told me behind the scenes so uh yeah we'll, we'll bring you and pat the burner back on to talk about this when it releases always got to support you know progressive projects i'm looking forward to this joy tell the people what we can do to watch your show and where to find you online um, so, uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at SavageJoyMarie1, um, and that's good to follow me for all my upcoming shows, um, and also for updates on the book and, you know, a link to pre-order, um, also you can follow my shows and see about 300 back episodes on Real Progress in Action on, um, YouTube, we just became a 501c3. Um, so we had to change the name to kind of, um, you know, become that 501c3 and keep politics separate from our economic side. Um, so yeah, follow us on there and check me out on Twitter. And I post a, a lot of uh, savage things, I'm told. So yeah, yeah. The name is, uh, I think, representative of uh, your character savage joy i didn't give it to myself so i hope so <laughs> <laughs> well joy it is always a pleasure we are always happy to have you on the show thank you for just like you know shooting the breeze and helping to digest what the fuck just happened over the last two years <laughs> Yeah, so we'll have to watch this back and be like, I don't know, we were kind of off or whoa, we were psychic. Like, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I, I've I've had, you know, both of those reactions to myself. Like, wow, I nailed it. Or, oh, I was wrong. So we'll see. It'll yeah. be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I love you. I adore you to pieces. Oh, same, same. Absolutely. It's always fun to talk shit with you. Subscribe if you like this video, folks. Mike's tremendous, and he's doing a really, really good job. Many people are telling me about how wonderful the Humanist Report is. Bigly.